Good afternoon, I'm Milton Walker with Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. Financial analyst Dennis Chung says the worsened revised growth forecast for Jamaica for this financial year has not come as a, as a surprise, as Shane Masters reports. On Wednesday, the Bank of Jamaica projected that the economy will contract by between 7 and 10 percent during the 2020-2021 fiscal year as a result of the impact of a COVID-19 pandemic. The BOJ had predicted a decline of 4 to 7 percent earlier this year. Now speaking on Thursday on the Morning Agenda program, financial analyst Dennis Chong said in April he predicted that the economy would have declined between 7 and a half to 20 percent. He is questioning the accuracy of some of the BOJ's main reasons for the revised growth forecast. The main reason for the decline is going to be tourism, which is obvious, and the unemployment. Right? So um, if, if, if we actually had responded differently in some respects, we could have saved on that unemployment downturn. But you Responded know, differently how? Um, well, I have never thought that the response to it sustainably was going to be that, you know, you need to go into, um, you know, so much of a, a lockdown mode. For example, St. Catherine, I mean, the locking down of St. Catherine, I think, was the Achilles heel in the, the economic outturn. He says enforcement of measures in Jamaica and across the world instead of lockdowns would have been more effective in managing the spread of the virus. BOJ Governor Richard Biles told yesterday's quarterly media briefing that the worsened outlook is largely associated with the virus's resurgence in major trading partner countries such as the United States and updated assessments of the impact of the crisis on some local sectors. Mr. Biles says partial economic recovery is expected to commence in the 2021-2022 fiscal year. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. There will have to be an agreement between companies on how they proceed after layoff periods have expired. This follows a failure to reach an agreement on redundancy between employers and the JCTU. More in this report. It will be up to individual employers and their workers to determine how they handle the issue of redundancy following failed efforts to arrive at a consensus on the matter. As companies struggle to deal with the fallout from COVID-19, many laid off workers to reduce expenses. However, the 120-day layoff period allowed under local labor laws before redundancy payments must be made has now expired at many of these companies with them unable to recall workers or pay them. Unions and employers were in talks to find a middle ground which would prevent redundancies. President of the Jamaica Confederation of Trade Unions, Helene Davis-White, told our news centre that the talks did not produce a consensus. Most of us have come to an understanding that the best way of dealing with it is by um, individual companies having discussions with their workers and unions as to what measures can be put in place to ensure that companies in this period may not have to make such payments and that workers will not make such claims because there seems to be a view that the, these payments are automatic. Workers have to make the claim. Mrs. Davis-White says some companies have already had discussions with workers and decided on a way forward. Meanwhile, she says the Labour Ministry has established a task force to look at issues arising out of the pandemic. That task force I expect may be delayed by virtue of the elections that have now been announced, but originally the time for completion of the work of the task force was set for the end of September. It's left to be seen whether that will have to be changed, seeing that um, elections have intervened. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. The opposition spokesman on health, Dr. Moray Sky, is calling on the health ministry to speed up the construction of field hospitals to facilitate the increase in COVID-19 patients requiring hospitalization. It comes as the country recorded over 300 cases of the virus since the start of the week. Dr. Guy says it's also more important following news that two hospitals, the UHWI and the Princess Margaret Hospitals, are at capacity with COVID-19 patients. We were the ones who called for a field hospital first. 
the minister subsequently indicated that the national arena would be converted to a field hospital. Subsequently, he threw cold water on that particular proposal. And then we are only learning last week that he indicated that an international partner is working with the government to have one established as quickly as possible. The numbers that were showing at first suggested that they did not want it, but we are always told that there would have been a second spike. And this is what we are seeing now. Certainly, it would be a good investment on behalf of the, the people of Jamaica. But in the short term, Dr. Guy is recommending that other wards at both institutions be converted to accommodate a possible increase in patient load. It is not only wards and ward space that is of concern, but the fact that the medical team, which is supposed to be looking after these patients on the wards, they are also in a state where there is physical exhaustion. There is a reduction in the numbers of doctors and nurses who will attend to these patients. So the remaining reduced amounts are under pressure. So it is of serious concern to us as the opposition in light of the fact that the numbers are spiraling. Last evening we saw 72. The day before we saw 120, 83, 116, 67, if you go back to the preceding days. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 prevention measures announced by the Prime Minister on Monday take effect today. Funeral services will be prohibited island-wide. Burials will be permitted with 15 persons comprising 10 mourners, as well as the officiating clergy, the funeral officials and persons preparing the graveside. Funeral processions will only include the hearse and the mourners. Churches will be prohibited from hosting conventions and other special events that promote large gatherings. Gatherings of more than 20 persons are not allowed outside places of worship. And the island-wide nightly curfew will be brought forward to 9 o'clock starting today. The new curfew time does not apply to Kingston and St. Andrew, Clarendon, St. Thomas and St. Catherine. The curfew for those parishes is 7 o'clock at night to 5 in the mornings. The curfew hours are set to continue until September 30. We take a break now on Midday News. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Continuing the news. The Jamaica Accountability Meter Portal wants parliamentarians who were flagged by the Integrity Commission for breaches of the anti-corruption law to be barred from contesting the general elections. Howard Mitchell is chairman of the organization and spoke this morning on TVJ's Smile Jamaica. Since 2017, at least 13 current and former parliamentarians have been flagged by the Integrity Commission for breaches of the anti-corruption law. Seven of those parliamentarians are contesting next week's general election. But the Jamaica Accountability Meter Portal says those parliamentarians should not be allowed to contest in the polls. The Jamaica Accountability Meter Portal is a non-profit organization that monitors the performance of elected parliamentarians. Chairman of the organization, Howard Mitchell, explains that while politicians may not do anything wrong, Refusing to provide a declaration of assets will see them breaching the anti-corruption law. When you are charged with this breach, your political party should have the responsibility to make sure, to investigate, that you repair the breach. Mm -hmm. okay? And that in considering you for candidacy, that you fix that breach. If you don't fix that breach, if you... Uh, if you are guilty and the court finds you guilty and you pay the fine, right, you should not be allowed to run for political office or, in the, in the alternative, until you fix the problem, you should be barred from political office. Mr. Mitchell adds that they should not be allowed to participate in nomination activities and a report from the Integrity Commission should also be sent to the Electoral Office of Jamaica about the matter. Under secrecy laws, the names of those individuals are not allowed to be published to the public. But in circumstances like these, where people are in breach, where they have done nothing about repairing the breach, then their names should be public. It's a public trust. It's, it's the country's assets, the assets that are being wasted. 40% estimated of our budgetary expenditure over the last 58 years has gone on corruption to fatten the pockets of 
people and to be exported and hidden away. And that is wrong. Mr. Mitchell argues that if the government is serious about corruption and discipline, it should empower agencies to tackle the issue. We should pass the regulations that allow MOCA to be independent. We should make sure that the Integrity Commission can act. If, if, it, if it needs to act through the DPP, which I concede, then the DPP must be resourced to act efficiently and quickly on the reports made by the Integrity Commission. And lastly, the Integrity Commission and the other agencies must be properly staffed by people who are efficient and know what they're doing and don't publish wrong reports. Prince Moore, TVJ News. Bank of Jamaica Governor Richard Biles attributed the fall in the tourist arrivals among the reasons for the depreciation of the Jamaican dollar. At the end of trading yesterday, the US dollar sold for $150 41 cents. Speaking at a press conference, Mr. Biles says public concern and anxiety are understandable. The reason for the weaker Jamaica dollar, ladies and gentlemen, is the significant reduction in the availability of U.S. dollar inflows into the system due primarily to the sudden stop in tourist arrivals since the onset of COVID-19 in Jamaica at the end of March this year and a slow recovery in the sector since the reopening of our borders in mid-June. He says the BOJ does not intend to intervene if at this time. If necessary, BOJ will, will act using both monetary policy and foreign exchange operations to ensure that movements in the exchange rate do not affect our inflation target. Let me emphasize, ladies and gentlemen, with gross reserves of 3.7 billion US dollars, Jamaica is in a stronger position than in previous crises. These reserves, if judiciously managed, will be adequate to see us through this temporary crisis. The People's National Party, the PMP, has called a press briefing for this afternoon to outline details of its wealthy plan for Jamaica. Under the plan, the party is promising to give each household $3,000 credit per month towards electricity bills and $1,000 credit per month towards their water bill. Combined, this is estimated to cost more than $26 billion. The party is expected to reveal, among other things, how this new plan will be funded. Residents of Somerset in East Rural St. Andrew are appealing to the relevant authority to intervene in what they described as a matter of urgent, uh, that requires urgent attention. This follows the impact of heavy rainfall which affected the island over the weekend and it has left the road in the community impossible to vehicular traffic. Don't buy rumber from Monday morning to come up. I run a little cob. We have to bring up seed from time to time and it is down there and it cannot come up. As you see, the road is in a very, very bad situation. Now we are calling on the relevant authority. When I am coming around at the rock around there, so yeah, water drop out of me, I can near the moment my high spin. For the road is very terrible and we need the road to fix it. If they want the election, they have to fix the road. Without fixing the road, nobody not going to vote. For everybody is balling right now. The road bad, 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 bad in a bad condition. Residents who benefit from social and welfare grants say they are also at a disadvantage. Persons who require medical attention are also affected. Yes, I am supposed to go out and collect my part. And I'm scared to go out on the road to my age you now. So I wouldn't mind the government come and give us immediately attention with the road. Send a tractor now and clean the road. That vehicle can come in and go out. I have to go to the doctor and choose my appointment. And we don't have no road, no road to come out and I can't walk. In news overseas, as Hurricane Laura pounds the United States, in addition to threatening lives, it's threatening oil production in the heartland of Texas. More from the CNN. 
Hurricane Laura is already wreaking havoc on America's energy belt, and with the flooding we're seeing already, this could last for a long while. Let's see what's in harm's way when it comes to the energy sector overall. More than 300 platforms and rigs have been shut in and evacuated. This represents 84% of the oil production on the Gulf Coast and better than 60% of natural gas output as well. Uh, in terms of oil, we're looking at about 1.5 million barrels a day, which is about 10% of the U.S. normal daily output. But the real suffering could happen in the refining sector because of uh, Hurricane Laura hitting landfall on the border of Texas and Louisiana in places like the Sabine Pass and Lake Charles in Louisiana and also Port Arthur. This is the real central hub of refining capacity. This means that gas prices at the pump could go higher if we look at historical paths in the past for, say, four to six weeks. If there is a silver lining right now, it has to be in the oil market itself. We've seen prices hit a, a five-month high, or right near there, uh, but they're hovering in a range of $43 for the U.S. benchmark and about $46 for the international benchmark North Sea Brent. That's not a huge rally so far. Uh, however, we're seeing damage estimates already in the range of 18 to $25 billion, and, and one report suggesting it could be about a fifth of that total uh, for the refining rebuilding that may need to take place because of the flooding and this huge surge, which is stretching in some 65 kilometers uh, into that area. How about the power outages? We've seen 400,000 customers plus without access uh, to power, and that number seems to be rising swiftly. In sports, Jamaica Stephanie Taylor will lead a strong 18-member West Indies women's squad next for, for next month's five-game T20 Tour of England. Cricket West Indies announced the squad yesterday afternoon. 14 members of the squad were part of the West Indies squad at the ICC Women's T20 World Cup in Australia early this year. Natasha McLean, Chidian Nation and Chenille Henry are the other Jamaicans named in the squad. All players were given the option to decline selection for any COVID-19 related concern, with Anisha Mohammed the only one to do so. Keisha Schultz is the only uncapped player in the squad. The West Indies will play five T20 matches against England from September 21 to 30 in a biosecure environment. The games will be played at the Incora County Ground in Derby. The third T20 on September 26 will be live on BBC TV, the first time international women's cricket has been on free-to-air television since the 1993 Women's World Cup. And that's the Midday News. I'm Milton Walker. Join us at 7 for primetime news on behalf of the news, sports and production teams. Good afternoon.